Tiger Sports Report Live, and I'm your host, Brian Moss. We are starting a series of articles and podcasts called Why I Coach. We'll interview various Memphis coaches and ask them why they chose to become a coach. First up is Memphis football running backs coach, Anthony Jones. Let's hear from Coach Jones and see what he has to say on why he became a coach. Go back to the high school. You you were a wide receiver at Westwood, correct? Yeah, so my sophomore and junior year, uh, I played both wide receiver and D and safety. Um, and then my senior year, I moved to quarterback. Uh, nice. Now, when you were when you were playing back then, you had any thoughts of coaching at all, or was it just all you know, just playing football? No, it was <laughs> just all playing football. Uh, I wasn't. I guess I was a decent athlete. I don't know how good of a quarterback I was, but um, threw for a bunch of yards because at that time, my my high school, we threw the ball a bunch. Um, I was I was an athlete, so I ran for a ton of yards, but. I don't know if I was a true quarterback. I didn't read anything. I can promise you that. <laughs> yeah. Now, what what schools were after you? I know you, you ultimately went to uh, Chattanooga, but was there any other schools yeah, so, that were after you? So, uh, a couple of schools, Tennessee State, Alabama State, uh, Texas Southern at the time. Memphis kind of flirted around with me a little bit, only to play DB, though. So, not as a quarterback or a receiver. Now, um, now uh, Miss. Now, growing up in Memphis, now was was the Tigers like? Did you root for them growing up? How did you view the Tigers when you were growing up? Absolutely. I mean, you always root for the home team, you know. And, and they were they were okay. They were decent. That was right around the start of the D. Angelo Williams era. Um, so, what the Tigers never they I, mean, I can't remember they offered or not. They wanted me to play DB, and I didn't think I was a good tackler, so <laughs> yeah. I wanted to play DB. And I, uh, and I'm going to Chattanooga to play receiver. Uh, so it was it was good. But yes, you always grew up rooting for the Tigers. I got a chance to uh, obviously go to a couple of games when I was a student in high school. So it was it was fun. Now then, you, you go to uh, Chattanooga. You, you play your uh, college ball there. Uh, at what point did you, uh, you know, go from player to all of a sudden now you're going to be a graduate assistant there? Uh, uh, you know, was it the, well, sometime during the senior yeah. year? Yeah, so it was. I guess it was. It was doing. It was doing my last. It was doing my junior year. Uh, so at the end of my junior year, so I guess in the middle of my junior year, I kind of found myself being like a leader inside of my position group. Um, so I kind of found myself guys coming to talk to me not only about just football problems, but just problems in general. And I kind of found myself as a junior giving advice to guys. Um, so when my senior rolled around, obviously you do the whole hosting and the recruit and all that stuff. And I found myself being a daddy. You know, I found myself telling telling the freshman guys, hey, listen, you don't be out in clubs past 12 midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning or you shouldn't have a car on campus because you don't know how to handle it type of deal. You know, so I kind of found myself in a leadership role as a player and didn't realize it. Then I realized, hey, maybe maybe this is something that I really want to do for sure. Good deal. And then uh, you you had that opportunity as the graduate assistant. Now, was it just one year you were at the uh, yeah, Chattanooga? It was actually, it was actually just for one one semester actually. Uh, so I did that, and I worked at Enterprise Running Car at the same time, just to kind of you know have some money. So what I would do is I would work Enterprise in the morning. Uh, come up to the office and do as much as I can during spring. Because uh, it was only during, during the 2008 winter. Uh, then I go to grad school at night. And I go back to the office and do the whole thing all over again. Because uh, I just, you know, you, you, you're done playing. You're not good enough to go to the National Football League. Nobody's calling your phone for the XFL or the, uh, the uh, uh, bring the football. You got to make a decision. Uh, that's what I that's what I chose to do, and then I realized, hey, I want I kind of want to coach high school, but I want to go back to my hometown and kind of be an impact in my hometown. Uh, and I was and I was fortunate enough to get that opportunity. I got a call, I think, in June, so I packed up and me and my girlfriend, which is my wife now, we uh, packed up on faith and we transferred enterprise jobs 
Then I had a Memphis, and I did that for about uh, about a month or two. I think in the month of June and July, actually. And then I started fresh in the fall. And you spent uh, what's it, four year, three or four years as an assistant at Westwood before the, they turned over the reins uh, to you. Yeah, I spent three years as an assistant at Westwood. So my first year, I was the receivers coach. Uh, year two and three, I was the uh, offensive coordinator. Uh, where I coached quarterbacks and receivers at the same time. And then year four and five was my first two years as a head football coach. When you first got that head football coach job, you know, what was running through your through your head at that time? Oh, everything. I mean, you. I've always dreamed of, of being a being a high school head coach. Once I started coaching, uh, so you try to take notes and you try to write notes down. Uh, but then when you actually get the call or when you get the recommendation to to be a head coach, uh, it's like you didn't prepare for this or you didn't prepare for that. You know and uh, it was, it was fun. It was mind-blowing. I was in a good situation because I already knew the kid. So it wasn't like I was walking into something brand new. Yeah. But it was good. I had really good support and really good staff. And, and the guys bought in really quick. And we hit the ground running. And before you uh, became that head coach, what, what coach or coaches, uh, you know, kind of helped you mold your, uh, mold you into the head coach when you first got that job? Yeah, so um, it goes back to to my junior high coach, a guy named Herman Adams, uh, way back in Chickasaw Junior High School. So I didn't start playing football until the eighth grade. And back then, junior highs were seventh through ninth grade. So my seventh grade year, I think I played basketball and ran track. And uh, so that's just, I was fast and going to be an athlete and never really thought about football. But my junior high coach, who was a team teacher, I mean, he was just such a positive guy. He was an older guy, but he was such a positive guy. And, and he wanted me to come out and play football, and I did. But he, he taught me so many life lessons in, in that short period of time, eighth grade and ninth grade. Uh, and he made an impact on my, own in my life with so many guys' lives that, that played at Chickasaw, you know. And uh, so that's why he, he's probably the main reason why I, I wanted to start coaching. And my dad was a basketball coach at his school uh, even before I was born. So, and I didn't know that until I actually started coaching. So, when I was born, uh, he was a building engineer at a school called St. Paul Catholic School, where he's still a building engineer now. And he kind of volunteered for the little peewee basketball team, and he was a coach. Uh, and I had no idea until I just ran ran across a picture, and that's when he told me, he said, yeah, I was a coach. And, uh, and I asked him, why didn't you never tell me you was a coach? And he said, because I didn't want you to coach because I was a coach. I oh, want you to live your own life. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was, you know, I thought that was unique. But uh, so those, those two people mainly are, are you know, kind of shaped my coaching career. There's been other high school coaches around um, that have kind of helped me and molded me in, in, that, in that mindset. So, uh, but those two guys in particular. For good, sure. good deal. Now, your first year uh, was a success at uh, Westwood. And I think, what was yeah. it, the first playoff uh, for Westwood in, what, 18 years? Was that that first yeah. year? First playoff in about 18 years, yes, sir. Now, uh, uh, did you have a good core group coming back, or what What was the immediate success there contributed to? Yeah, so we had we had a good group coming back. Uh, basically, my, my, my deal was I wanted to wait. I wanted to... I wanted to eliminate the waste of time, and I wanted to I wanted to just to, just to run this program as much of the college program as I could. Because uh, back in my community of Westwood, no nobody really went to college those days. You mm-hmm. know, especially for football, we've had guys go through the past, but as of lately, nobody's ever been. So I want those guys to to understand what I've been through and let them know that I mean, four or five years ago, I was in the same spot as a student. You know, but now as a, now as a coach, uh, I want those guys to realize that they can do it as well. So I just wanted to run. I wanted to have structure. I wanted to have discipline, uh, and I wanted to treat them not not as boys. But I wanted to treat them as young men. You know, so I didn't want to I didn't want to hold their hand and babysit them. Uh, we had rules, and, and the rules were simple. They was cut throat, cut cut throat, and they they weren't really a lot of rules. It was just the main, you know, do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it. 
And if the kids did it, it worked. If the kids didn't, then they got punished for it. Uh, and that worked. You know, it wasn't a lot of in-between rules. It wasn't a lot of things to kind of cater to the kids. It was just real cut and dry, you know, so. And I, and I think that helped. And I talked about the, the the process that it took for you to leave Westwood to go to Cordova. Uh, was that a hard decision, or uh, you walk through that oh, process? Absolutely. So uh, I've told this story a million times. I'm glad you <laughs> So it was it was Super Bowl Sunday, and I was I just finished my second season as a head coach, and I had the itch to get to college. So Jerry Mack is another guy who's been influential to me in my in my coaching career, in my journey. He's the OC at Rice right now. Um. And he, he was, when he was the OC at Pine Bluff, I kind of went and spent the whole day with him. And I think that day is when I kind of got the urge to coach college ball. So he hooked me up with a guy named Todd Cooley, who was the head coach at Delta State. And I went and interviewed for the wide receiver job at Delta State. And he offered me the job on the spot, but he said it's $20,000, no benefits. Uh, so I went home that night, I prayed, and I tried to figure out every way I could make it work, but I couldn't. Because I had a wife and I had a brand new daughter that was mm-hmm. born two months earlier in November. So that didn't happen. Uh, a couple of weeks later, the National Coaches Convention was in Nashville. And Carson Newman had a running back job open. And at the time, it was the legendary coach, Coach Ken Sparks. And I remember running, literally running around uh, the Gaylord Hotel trying to find a printer just so I could print off my resume and give it to, to Coach Sparks. And he and at the time, he was the president of, of the FCA. When he was going to a dinner. And one of his assistant coaches said, listen, he's going to a dinner. you got to catch him. If you catch him, give it to him. And it was almost like fate. I was running. I was running up the steps. And I'll never forget this. I was literally running. And I called him. And I gave him a sheet of paper that had my resume on. Well, he called me back. I drove to Jefferson City the next week. Uh, in a reason, he offered me the running back job. But it was twenty five thousand dollars with no benefits, <laughs> and I couldn't do that one either. Um, so now I just settled on staying at Cordova, and then I actually interviewed for the Cordova job, and I didn't get it at first. They gave it to the interim guy, um, and he had it. And I called and I congratulated him on getting the job. I said, "Hey, you deserve it. Congratulations. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know." And five months later, in May. He actually called me and said, hey, listen, I'm taking a, I'm taking a, at, a, at, a, at a local school, and I want you to be the head coach. And that's how I became the head coach at Cordova. So, oh, nice. Interesting story. Yeah, and then, but you you had success uh, pretty quickly as well. You had, the, what, the first winning season there in nine years, and then, what, 2016 yeah. went 12-2. and two. Was that the most uh, wins in school history at that time? Most wins in school history, uh, and it was fun. I mean, I had a great group of coaches, a uh, great group of kids. But the administration was great. The, the school was great. The community really rallied around us. Uh, it was fun. It was it was fun from the day I walked in to the day I left. Uh, just seeing the transformation and seeing the new kids that went on to go to college and sign football scholarships and not even that. I mean, just seeing those guys graduate and become productive citizens has been, has been fun. Yeah, and you had uh, been pretty successful in getting your kids to uh, college, too. From what I can find, of the six years, I think you put somewhere around 75 players uh, that went on to play football on scholarship. Does that sound correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, something, that's something great. And, you know, all, and then how did you get to, you know, to Memphis, uh, Tigers? Uh, did they call you? How, how did that come about? So... Uh... I was Norvell's first school that he stopped by. So Daryl Dickey, who was the running back coach at the time, was the area recruiter for the Memphis area. And when Norvell first got hired, uh, I was actually at practice for the bowl game when Dickey was the interim coach. They were, they were preparing for the Birmingham Bowl, and I remember Coach Norvell walking out, and I was just a spectator on the sideline. Uh, and Coach Dickey introduced me as a local high school coach at Cordova, and we shook hands, and that was really it. That was that was it, and then uh, later, maybe the next week, Coach Dickey brought him around to the schools for the recruit period, and I was the first school. And we sat and talked. We had a genuine conversation. You can tell Coach Novell was a genuine person, and he said, "Hey, hey listen, AJ, anytime you want to come over, let me know. Come over." Um, 
and I did. So I went and watched every spring practice I could just to kind of learn. And I was, he was an offensive genius. Uh, wanted to learn and kind of implement his ways and his practice styles into what we are doing. We kind of stayed in contact. Uh, and I actually interviewed for the uh, – for off the field role, uh, maybe a year later, and I didn't get it. Uh, I didn't get it, and he said, "No, you, you're not the fit for this job." Uh, and then Darren Dick ended up getting the job at Texas A&M, and Dick called me and said, "Hey, I'm leaving." And then about 30 minutes later, Marvell called and said, "Hey, Coach Dick has just left. I want to interview you for the running back job." Uh, so he interviewed me on a on a Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. And then on Thursday, he called and offered me the job. And it was, um, I was one of the greatest days of my life, you know. So I'm oh, forever nice. indebted to him for doing that. And how was that transition going from high school to, you know, college coaching? Uh, it was scary at first. <laughs> you know, when you walk into a program at the time with Memphis and Coach Norville, and those guys had it rolling. And then Coach Dickey did an armor league with John with those running backs, and the system was, was, was what it was. And, you're walking in, you want to walk in not to just screw it up. But the guys of the room that I walked into, they were so phenomenal. I mean, you're talking about the Daryl Hendersons of the world and the Tony Pollard and uh, Patrick Taylor and all those guys that was there. I mean, they kind of welcomed me with open arms, you know, and, and they were great. They were true student athletes. They were they were professionals. Uh, and they embraced me. They were trying to learn this thing together. And, uh, and the staff that was already there, they, they welcomed me with open arms and coaching on the field. And everybody played a huge part of, of making that transition smooth for me. So, and that was, that was awesome. Now, what, what's the differences from when you were a player going through the recruiting process to, to now as a coach, uh, seeing kids going through the recruiting process? Is, is, what are some similarities and some differences? Obviously, social media is a major difference, but uh, is that really yeah. the only difference? I guess I'm one of the few coaches in coaching college ball that can say that they've seen it on, seen it on both sides. So I've yeah. seen it as a high school coach, and I've seen it as a collegiate coach. Um, these kids get absolutely hounded. I mean, they get text messages pretty much all day. Somebody from some school is always in the book, you know, and it's, it's kind of overwhelming for kids. So I recruit a little different, you know, and, and because I want to make sure that I put the value on a young man as a young man and not as a, and not as a football player. Um, but I guess most of these, I mean, you have social media, you have tons of different camps now that these kids can go to and get us going. Whereas when I was getting recruited, it, it wasn't that. Um, obviously, social media is probably the biggest advantage that these kids have. Uh, I think every morning I wake up, I wake up to at least, you know, coach, can you please watch my film type deal? Whether it's mm-hmm. from a kid, whether it's from a parent, whether it's from a coach, uh, and I try to take time to respond to each and every last one of them because three, four years ago, I was doing the exact same thing, you know. And uh, yeah, I think I think now it's just, it's, it's frustrating for these kids because some kids look at Twitter and they only see the five star and the four star kids, and a lot of those kids kind of get discouraged and they and they forget about the lower level schools, um, mm-hmm. which I don't think it should be like that. You know, I think that. It's a place for it's a place for everybody. Uh, I think the recruiting could be a really good thing. It's obviously about building relationships. Uh, if if the coaches and the schools do it the right way, you know, I think it can be a wonderful thing. So, and I also use it to help other people out as well. So, if if we can have a well, I'm sorry, if if we don't have a spot at the University of Memphis, I would probably call my buddy at UT Martin or Richmond or Alabama A and M and say, Hey, listen. I got a kid we won't be able to take, but I think he may be a good fit for you, you know. And um, but they have they have so many more resources now than what we had in the past. Yep, and, and you know, your approach to recruiting, uh, do you look at uh, the person first or the player first? Uh, obviously, you look at the player first. I mean, a lot of people should look at the person first. Well, if the kid can not play, you won't recruit him, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then after you say, well, hey, this kid can play at our level. Then that's when you want to do your homework on the kid. You want to talk to him. You want to talk to the high school coach. And I like to talk to somebody beyond the high school coach, whether it's a teacher or a guy or a counselor, a janitor or a principal, uh, to let me know, okay, what is this kid really like? 
uh, because you don't want to waste time and you don't want to miss. And we've been so very, very fortunate here at the University of Memphis that we have really, really good kids in our program. And I think that's a test to, that's, that's an testament to uh, the plan that Coach Novell could put in place and now what Coach Silverfield is doing now of actually doing your research and your homework on kids. And yes, we want good players. We, we wouldn't watch the film. We wouldn't reach out if they weren't a good player. Uh, but after we realize they're a good player, we want to make sure that they're even better human beings. Uh, you know, we've had some we've had some cases where we see some good guys on film, uh, and we did our research and we and we went we went in another direction. You know, so uh, and that's how I like to do it. You know, I like to to see who is involved in the recruiting process and and kind of go from there. And, and how do you personally balance the, the work life with the home life? Because family is very important. And so, so how do you keep them engaged and, and let you know that you're there and that you love them and things like that? No doubt. So what I try to do is I try to, uh, I try to take my, number one, I try to take my girls to school as much as I possibly can. Um, so if we don't have to be in the office until 7.30, I can take them to the forecare and I can speed the work uh, and try to, his work is only about 20 minutes from my home. So I, I try to take them to school as much as I can because they don't know, they don't know, they they, they know dad is a college football coach, but they don't know what that entails. Obviously, we do have long nights, so FaceTime is really good for that. Anytime we're out of the office, we're out of the office. You know, we try to rush home, watch soccer games. Um, I try to spend as much time with them as I humanly possibly can. And even with that, when we have practice, it was really good for spring practice because in the, in the fall, we wear morning. And in the springtime, when we're doing workouts, when in the summertime, we're doing OTA type of deal, I have my family come up there with me, you know, and they'll kind of watch practice. And after practice, we'll get on the track together and walk the track and play, and we'll have the guys over by the house. So we try to, we try to make it as fun and as normal for us, for our kids as we possibly can. And my wife, she's the, she's the rock star of it all. She, she kind of holds this thing together. Nice. And uh, for, for you, what's the best thing about being a college football coach? It's the impact and the platform. Uh, it, it's kind of the same as, as a high school head coach, but here at the collegiate level, obviously you can, you can reach, we can reach a lot more people. You can go through the masses and, and uh, you, can have, you can have a greater platform because people look at you in a different light when you're a coach versus a head coach in high school. Uh, but, but the message is still the same. You know, you you want to you want to motivate people. You want to encourage people. You want to have an image. Uh, and hey, this is this is where was going. So, and uh, that's almost the same. Yeah, the uh, the players that you have on the on um, at Memphis now. Uh, I get well ever since you've been there. Who's been the most fun to coach? Uh, the most fun to coach. Say all of them. All of them. Uh, that's a tough question. All yeah. Uh -huh. Now, has there been one that's been the most difficult or most surprising one to coach that you thought maybe was going to be a difficult time, but end up being? Oh, this is the, this is a special player, special relationship that you've built. Well, uh, I guess you can say all of them. Yeah, I know that's a kind of a vague answer. No, that's I all right. Guess people like Darren Henderson, Darren Henderson and Tony Pollock and Patrick Taylor, obviously. Along with Kenneth Gainwell, now they've been the best, but they are—they are. All of my guys are, are the opposite of what people may think that they really are. Uh, so we've been very fortunate and blessed to have those four running backs and guys like Calvin Watkins and, and Rodriguez Clark too. Uh, people would think that they're loud, ambitious guys when. My room is really quiet and, and, and soft. Like, Daryl Henderson did not talk as much. Uh, Kenneth Gainwell is about as quiet as a kid you'll ever see. Patrick was probably the one that talked the most, but even he was quiet. You know, he didn't, he didn't see those guys out with me. And uh, uh, Patrick, he, all, he also seemed like uh, he was beyond his years. He was like, a, I guess, a father figure to some of the other running backs. Was that the, the case? No, no. Patrick is... Patrick was... was it, this, this past 2019 season, Patrick was probably the greatest football player in college football. Uh, and I mean that from a, 
human being point of view. I mean, you go out, you work so hard. I mean, he's done everything right. I mean, Patrick, he created, he laid his own ballast because it was not anybody telling him to. You know, and if if you have a daughter the age of 20, 21, 22 years old, you you would want Patrick to marry your daughter. Uh, matter of fact, you would you would hurry up and run her down the aisle because she's walking her down the aisle because he's such a special young man. And to see him get hurt and have to miss eight, nine games uh, was heartbreaking. And mm-hmm. it was heartbreaking for him, but he never showed it. I mean, he, he, he showed up to every meeting. He was at every every walk through, every practice, every game. Uh, and he was encouraging guys. And to see that he was, he was, he was a draft pick. You know, he was mm-hmm. he could have went out his junior year and been a third round pick. Uh, but he decided to come back and he gets hurt. And for him to give to him to him to still have a smile on his face and to go about doing things the right way, uh, has and with this uh, this coronavirus going around, you know the spring practice is you know uh, I think canceled. How does how's that affecting uh, the team? How how do you guys you know communicate with the team to make sure everyone's still staying in, in, in fitness and you know somewhat I guess game shape and and game sharpness. Uh, so you know, whoever whoever created Zoom is probably a billionaire right now because that is that is probably the absolute best way to talk to you guys. We just try to stay communicate with them without overbearing. Mm-hmm. So Coach Silver put a great plan in place to where everybody in our department, in our football department, uh, does a great job of, of contacting those guys, whether it's academics, whether it's a strength staff, uh, counseling department, out of the football, uh, nutrition, and, and athletic training. We all have a, have a role of, of talking to those guys and getting with those guys. Um, so we just try to stay in constant communication with them. They're sending us videos of those guys of, of them working out. A lot of kind of some of them work out together a little bit if they can. Uh, but a lot of them are back home at their hometown, just trying to just trying to survive and, and trying to try and do the best that they can do. You know, so. Yeah, you know, if you weren't coaching, what would you be doing? I have no idea. <laughs> And so your your ambitions um, your ambitions is the coach. Uh, now uh, you know f- going on future. Would you like to eventually you know take over a, a, a college program yourself? Absolutely, absolutely. I would I would love one day to be uh, to be an offensive coordinator uh, and a head fo- and a head football coach one day. You know, and mm-hmm. uh, and not not just for the sake of being a head football coach. But I want to be a head football coach because. You can impact so many people. You can impact not only your players, you can impact the parents, you can impact the community. You can impact the, your university as well as your entire city. Uh, I think you can have so much fun doing it, doing it the right way. You know, so yes, that is that is one of my goals for sure. We'd like to thank Coach Jones for his time and sharing his story with us. Please check out TigerSportsReport.com for more articles and our next. Why I Coach podcast will feature special teams coach Pete Limbo.